I hope it was not the act of sabotage. So. <laughs> Uh, welcome to everyone who decided to attend the 34th uh, mini lecture organized by the School of Journalism at the University of Regina. My name is uh, Gennady Chernov and I am Associate Professor at the School of Journalism. And on behalf of the School of Journalism, I'd like also to extend our welcome to uh, Gillian Murad and the members of the mini family. Thanks also to the Regina Christophers and the Al Weijer Consulting Group, as well as Gail Harrington Mitchell for their kind donations to the mini lecture. Without such donations, the mini fee could not continue to be offered. We got used to think about journalism as a profession. We teach our students that journalists are the people who inform their audiences on the issues of public importance. Journalists try to collect, arrange, and present information which reflects facts as they are. But we sometimes forget that such truthful representations require courage on behalf of journalists as well. Truthful information becomes the friend of freedom and the enemy of dictators, and it's especially true for international journalism. Those who hate truth try to silence journalists. Only yesterday I uh, read about uh, killing one Swedish reporter, radio reporter in Kabul. It happened yesterday. The same day I read about uh, several journalists in the Crimea. Uh, they were kidnapped and beaten up. Professionalism and courage are the qualities of many journalists, and our today's guest, Nahla Ayer, is one of them. We are honored to have Nahla to deliver the mini-field lecture tonight. Before I will give the floor to uh, you know, Rick Aglier, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, I uh, simply want to tell you that we'll have time for uh, asking questions. Uh, questions. So, I would like to ask you not to uh, make a five-minute statement. <laughs> by, that, we will, by that, we will be sure. By that, we will ensure that everybody, or at least everybody, will have a chance to ask. So I hope that we are all civilized people, and we will reserve our own views for smaller audiences. <laughs> and now, uh, let me invite Rick Lear, the dean of the Faculty of Arts, to introduce Nella Kaye. Before we get started, could I maybe ask you to reach into your pocket, pull out your phone, and turn off the ringer if you haven't already done so? Thank you. My few brief introductory remarks tonight are for the five people in this audience who do not already know Nella Ayed and her body of work. She is a veteran CBC foreign correspondent currently based in London, but this is a sort of homecoming for her since she was born and raised in Winnipeg. She joined the CBC in 2002, having previously served as a parliamentary reporter for the Canadian press. From 2004 to 2009, she was the CBC's correspondent in Beirut. During that time, I had traveled the Middle East extensively, reporting on many conflicts and interviewing key leaders. She continues to cover international stories out of London. The Arab uprisings were prominent in her reporting. Ayat has reported from many other places as well, including India, Pakistan, Kenya, Haiti, and throughout Europe. Her reporting has been recognized through numerous national and international awards and nominations. She is a graduate of Carleton University's Master of Journalism program. She also holds a BSc in Genetics and a Master's degree in Interdisciplinary Studies. She was awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Manitoba in 2007 for distinguished achievement. I had recently published A Thousand Farewells, A Reporter's Journey from Refugee Camp to the Arab Spring, which made Amazon.ca's list of best books of 2012. Please join me in welcoming Nala Ayed. To this. Usually I talk to an inanimate camera and it does all the work and this is, this is um, quite humbling. It's great to be here. Thank you very much for coming tonight. 
Um, it's an honor to be here, obviously, uh, in Rajana. I haven't been here for many years. But it's particularly an honor to, um, to give them in a few lecture. Uh, he embodied, as, as you know, the best of Canadian foreign journalism, an um, early integrator, we're all about integration now, who filed radio and television, and I'm sure he would have filed for online had it existed when he was working. Um, it's an honor to be here, but it's also kind of a, a bit of a miracle because the story of coming here, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit like the job that we do, a little bit like doing foreign correspondence. Um, because just like foreign correspondence, every possible obstacle that, was, that could possibly be thrown in my way getting here happened. <laughs> um, even this, this last leg of this, the, the last leg of this journey, I came here from Toronto just a couple of hours, a few hours ago. Um, I barely made it out of Toronto. I'm sure you heard about the weather reports. The wet snow and a huge lineup of planes and de-icing and I, I, can't, I can't believe I'm here. <laughs> um, so just like every story that we file, the object, um, as painful as it might be, is to make deadline. And so I guess I've made the deadline, so I'm happy with that. Um, <laughs> the idea, of course, thank you. The idea, of course, is that an imperfect story or, or a yeah, an imperfect story, but an accurate story is better than no story. It's better than dead air. So every day what you see, you know, the stories that we file is, is actually a compromise. It's a huge compromise. Um, we work really, really hard to bring you the very best that we can, the most complete story that we can. But every single story you see is a series of compromises. It's just the reality. Um, I'll just tell you a little story that illustrates, I guess, the kind of thinking that we have in this culture of very strange culture of foreign correspondence. And I, I apologize because it's one of my favorite stories, and I'm sure if you've heard me speak before, you've heard this story. But for those who haven't, it's, I like to tell it because it's, it's kind of funny. But one day early on when I was in Baghdad, you know, just early in my foreign correspondent career, I, um, we used to back then, in those old days before FTP and Twitter and internet, we used to send our, our stories using satellite. And so we would go to, an establishment that provided this service would pay a thousand dollars because we wouldn't pay it, our bosses would. And we'd be able to send 10 minutes of material. So we had, um, I was with a colleague, Jim Hoffman, a great cameraman, uh, and we had done this lovely story. I don't even remember what the story was, but we did this story. We went to the Palestine Hotel in the middle of Baghdad. It was nighttime, you're not supposed to travel at nighttime, so already we're taking a risk. And, uh, and went there and handed the tape to our friends at uh, the Associated Press and said, press play and they press play and we watch it go out and you're proud watching your little baby going out to the world. And uh, so the item played and at the very end it was supposed to have a stand up and it didn't, it was black. There was no me standing there at the microphone. That's an incomplete story, that's, that's not good. Um, so when this happened, I, I, you can imagine I was I kind of lost it. Where's, this, where's the stand up? And uh, Jim says, well, I don't know. And so we're trying to figure out, what do you do? So the, uh, the guys at the satellite station said, well, you can go do it live. I mean, the satellite <laughs> provides a, play, a tape player, but you can also go stand up in front of a camera and also do a whole 10 minutes of live, if you like, and get your material there. And I said, why don't you go up? We still have five minutes. I said, great. So I run up the stairs. I, I run up after the cameraman. We're running up the stairs, we're running across the roof, the second roof of the Palestine Hotel, so I'm not way up there, I'm sort of at a mezzanine level. And there's generators and cords and electrical implements and all kinds of stuff, it's nighttime. And I'm trying to remember, what is my stand-up? I can't remember my stand-up. So I'm going over and I'm just following blindly this person and suddenly the whole world turned upside down. It just went dark. Just like, I fell over somehow and I, I, I something, there was a big bang. I thought, my God, the Palestine Hotel's been hit. It turns out it hadn't been hit, it had fallen off the roof. <laughs> so I'd fallen about nine feet down, and I, I realized this when I opened my eyes and, and realized what had happened. And um, this, and again, this is the point where, it, it, so you understand how we think. I, it was so painful, I actually started to cry. Adults don't cry when they fall, I did. <laughs> and. Uh, and I heard people calling for me, and I said, I'm down here, come get me. So they got me, and I, they pulled me up, and I, was, I literally was, was crying. And this is how we think. I hear from next to me, we hear, you still have three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I wiped, up, I, wiped up, I wiped up my tears, and 
something like this, and I suddenly remembered my stand-up, and I did it in one take. <laughs> and the story got to air that night. <laughs> so that's how we think. That's, how, that's what it's about. It's making deadline, no matter what. So, um, ever since those days, or even since those days, I mean, foreign reporting has really changed, and the way we file has changed. I mean, now all I need is this. You know, I take it everywhere. Um, but so, certainly what has changed is that fewer and fewer of us are doing this job. In fact, right now, um, there's so few of us that we multitask constantly. Um, and in fact, right now, as you probably have heard, I'm here to see you. I just come through Toronto, as I mentioned, via Ottawa. But in case you haven't been watching The National, I come to you via Crimea. And before that, via Sochi. Um, yes, I was there for the Olympics for the privilege of interviewing a certain Saskatchewan young man <laughs> with a broken rib who managed still to get a medal. Makes you proud, doesn't it? Um, he'd just gotten off the plane when I met him. I'd heard a lot about him, but I'd never met him. And I stuck a microphone in his face, and uh, he just started talking, cheeky as ever. Um, I also got to do a couple of hockey stories which came a little bit sort of more naturally to me than, than other things I was assigned. Because as a Winnipegger, of course, we love the Jets, and we, uh, I went to quite a few Jets games. Oh my God. <laughs> and, um, but things kind of fell apart when the boss said, guess what you're doing today? And I said, what? And he said, ice dancing. <laughs> really? Ice dancing? You can imagine how I reacted. I just spent a few weeks working on some serious stories about Russia. Um, about stories about gay rights in Russia, stories about the environmental impact of the Olympics, um, stories about young people in Russia. They're not what you expect. I hope you saw some of those stories. They're not at all what you would expect. Some really fascinating stuff. And then I headed this ice dancing file. Nothing against ice dancing. I just know nothing about it. Uh, and I didn't have an option saying no. So I had to think of it in my terms. I thought, it is a conflict, isn't it? So I, I, know, I know conflicts, you know? Um, Anyway, I couldn't complain. It was, it was still fantastic to cover the Olympics. What a great change from what I normally do. I really love doing it. And it was incredible weather. You know, while Mr. McCrib was doing his flips at the extreme park in the, in the mountains, we were filming people swimming in the Black Sea at the beach. So I couldn't really uh, complain about that. But um, after a, a non-stop month in Sochi, I found myself a little bit just further down the coast um, of the Black Sea, by London, of course, it has to be to get to Simferopol. I'm sure it's a name that's more familiar to you now if you hadn't heard of it before. Not very far away, I probably could have swum if I'd known I had to get there. Uh, and there we, did, we met a very different Russia. In Sochi I actually happened, it was a fluke, happened to see uh, President Putin in the flesh one day, taking down a stroll down um, the boardwalk uh, near the Black Sea on the coast looking relaxed and projecting a kind of soft power, which he's touted as Russia's new way of thinking. So one moment he was in Sochi, sort of basking in this benign spotlight of, of uh, sporting glory and kissing medalists and uh, talking about hockey and, and saying how his team was going to beat ours. A few days later, a much more solemn and more serious Putin was uh, watching military exercises at the border with Ukraine. And somewhere between these two events, which I witnessed, I mean, I wasn't there for the military exercises, but I watched them on television doing that. There was a revolution in Kiev, as you know. Um, the government was brought down, and a new one took its place. And in response, Russian troops tightened their hold on Crimea, sparking the worst east-west uh, spat, I guess, for lack of a better word, or conflict in a generation, and paving the way for the peninsula uh, returning to the Russian fold. It was here that I landed literally three days later after I had left Sochi. And talk about surreal. Um, in many ways, it felt like Russia, Simferopol. It's, um, you know, the music, the language, the feel, because I had just been in Russia. I, I, I had this all on my head. Same weather, same coastline. In other ways, it was very different. It also has a significant Tatar community, Tatar Muslim community. It has a significant, obviously, Ukrainian community. Anyway, before we get to all that, um, this was supposed to be the week that I was, while I was in Ukraine, was, I was supposed to be writing the speech that I'm giving to you now. <laughs> um, 
So instead, I was chasing protests and filing news every day until this past Sunday. So as we flew over to, to get to Simferopol, I had to come up with a really quick solution to what I was going to say to you tonight. I knew it had to be about foreign correspondence. And I knew it would be tight. I knew I wouldn't get out until Sunday. And I knew that if war started for some reason, I wouldn't be here at all. But I knew I had to be ready. So, um, so it came to me that I thought, well, I'm going to be in Ukraine. I'm going to be talking about foreign reportage. So why not have you join me on this journey to Ukraine? So I decided to try to keep a diary which I'm really terrible at. This requires quite a bit of diligence, but when you're in a job like mine, where you gotta write every single day, the last thing you wanna do at the end of the day is write more. Um, but I figured it's, it, I had to do this. Look at this incredible crowd. I had to prepare something. So, um, so I thought I'd try. So, so you'll have to forgive me, I'm gonna read you some of the stuff I wrote, which by the way, dwindles as the day goes on, <laughs> because it just got busier and busier. So, uh, um, so the Sochi assignment, as I said, just to go back one step, was, was fun, no doubt, but it was constant filing, you know, every day, two or three or four stories every single day for uh, just over four weeks. And we had uh, our cameraman, Richard Devey, our genius cameraman editor, and Tracy Seeley, who is also a Saskatchewan native. Um, she uh, is a producer, she works with us as well. And by the way, I have to share something about Tracy, whose parents are sitting in this crowd. Um, she had something else in common with McMorris, aside from attending the Olympics. She too had a broken rib, okay? <laughs> and she too had come to the Olympics determined to do her job despite the pain. So naturally we started calling her Tracy McRib. <laughs> in any case, a whole month later, we landed uh, in London after the Olympics, relieved to be home, only literally the very next day started talking about going to Simferopol. So Tracy McCrib and I, we spent Thursday sleeping, Friday was laundry, a little bit of dinner that night, Saturday was packing, talking to our parents, and Sunday we were on a flight. So here's a little bit of what I wrote that morning. I'll read you a little bit and then tell you about it. So it, uh, it starts like this. It happens to be exactly the 10th anniversary of that horrible day in Baghdad when I witnessed a bombing and got caught up in an angry crowd pulled in 100 directions. I try to ignore the irony in that, given the reports of harassment and beatings of journalists where I'm going. I try to ignore the date every year, in fact. According to the in-flight map, there are 281 miles left to our destination in Kiev. The next day, we would be on to Simferopol, on Crimea Peninsula, on the Black Sea. I'm pointing at the obvious here, but anyway, I have to read it exactly as written to be authentic. Strange to think that I was just in this neighborhood exactly four days ago. Strange to think I was adamant about getting rest this time once I was done. But this is important. This feels in a way as a continuation of my many years in the Middle East, not simply a story of war or conflict, which are varied and numerous and happen around the world, but because so much of what I covered in the Middle East, so many of its conflicts emanated, ebbed and flowed, grew and shrunk, depending exactly on how this particular conflict between the US and Russia evolved. I had long reported in Lebanon, for example, that the Sunni side was backed by Saudi Arabia and in turn by the US, while the Shia side, backed by Syria and Iran, was backed by Russia. I'd been in Afghanistan. I had read The Great Game, which I'm sure many of you have as well. I spent a great deal of time in Syria and Libya and Iran. I knew the different worldviews. But those were always third-party skirmishes, proxy wars, real and imagined, about influence in a strategic region relatively far from both. Ukraine would be different. This would be at the heart of this low-level conflict, at Russia's doorstep, but also smack in the middle between East and West, the closest you would get to a US-Russia war. From the start, I didn't expect all-out war. How's that possible in this day and age? This is still me writing, by the way. Yet people talked about World War III. I thought it an exaggeration. Surely this was the same Putin who we'd just seen visiting US and Canada House with messages of goodwill. Surely the US still wanted Russia's cooperation to solve problems in Syria and Iran and a whole host of other issues. I knew it still wouldn't be easy. There were already clashes between residents of Crimea and Russian soldiers were on the ground. But I went because I am compelled to understand. And I felt that to understand, I had to make my way here to see it with my own eyes. 
I went because it is my job to do so. It's what I'm paid to do. It's my mission. It's not brave. It's not courageous. There's no sympathy needed. It is my job. A job I happen to be very motivated to do. On the flights over to various places, I always see the same faces. There is really a small group in the world uh, of people who do this, and you see them over and over. And our preparations reminded me of my trips to Iraq. Most important when you're packing for such a possible conflict is communications gear and transport. So some of the things that I pack, just to give you, this is still me writing. It's boring to me, I don't know, I'm just telling you what I, what I wrote. This is what I wrote. A flak jacket, a helmet, those are important, obviously. My first war shirt, the shirt that I always take with me everywhere I go when there's a conflict. Besides that, clothing-wise, I pack the same way I would pack as I went to Winnipeg, uh, or Regina for that matter, heavy coat, boots, hand warmers, and hats. And what I always bring with me is comfort stuff, which is my kettle, medications, dark chocolate, and music. On transport, the airport in Crimea was closed. The, the flights were sporadic. We went through three or four different scenarios. Should we take the road? Some of the worst highways in Europe are in Ukraine. We heard colleagues had flak jackets and cameras confiscated. The train? 15 hours from Kiev. Some of our colleagues were heading that way the day before. We would watch to see how it goes for them. Should we wait for a flight? We decided that was probably the best plan. So we're contemplating all of this in Kiev, where we landed and immediately headed to Independence Square. Incredible the difference between my little neighborhood in London and Maidan. Absolutely incredible. Meanwhile, the similarities between Maidan, which is Independence Square, and Tahrir Square, after the killing of protesters there. It was the same somber mood, the smoky smell, the barricades, and the ashen faces. Memories came flooding back. But we had to get to work. So we went for interviews in the square and on camera, a later interview with a member of parliament, one of the new ones. We file, we finish at three in the morning, head to the airport at eight to land in Simferopol at 11, and the marathon begins. So that's what I wrote. So the pressure was already on. We hear about, as I mentioned, the thugs, the journalists who are being harassed, the terrible road conditions. All of it had to be processed in our heads along with the editorial content. I was trying to devour my little phone as many articles as I could from as many sources as I could just to see what is being written about the story. Um, I looked at American, British, Arab, you name it, all kinds of articles, just to kind of get a sense, what is my benchmark? What am I comparing what I see with my own eyes against? One thing we had heard was that the airport was surrounded by soldiers. So in my mind, it was one of the first facts we could check as soon as we land. So I was watching from our little window, I always take a window seat, um, for any unusual signs, you know, when we landed. It was a nice sunny day, and. There was hardly a soul in the tarmac. It looked like ordinary movement. We got out and waited in the small lobby of, of that very tiny airport. Still nothing unusual. One of our bags was missing, unfortunately. We went and I went and filled out the forms the way you do at every other airport that you, you know, across this country, and walked away with our bags to load them in our car and leave. And it was only at the very end of the airport, as you're driving out, that we finally noticed the gunman. There were three of them, exactly three, wearing what happened to be, or what appeared to be, sorry, Russian military uniform, which I couldn't confirm yet because I don't know what a Russian military uniform looks like. They were carrying Kalashnikovs, and unfortunately I do know what those look like. And in front of them you, were three guys what, that you would call, what you've heard this expression, these self-defense unit guys, who uh, were not armed, but they were carrying these uh, riot shields in front of them. And they were all, the six of them, kind of standing there motionless in front of the administrative building of the airport, just before you exit um, the area. No one tried, none of them tried to get in our way, no one stopped us, and we just drove into the city. So that was the first thing that we saw. Um, it was an interesting detail. I mean, it could have very well been that the airport had been surrounded and that by the time I got there, it wasn't surrounded anymore. That's entirely possible. But for the next several days, I kept hearing reports, and I, to tell you, I read constantly while I'm on a story to see what other people are doing. I kept hearing about this airport that was surrounded by soldiers. And in fact, had reports that it was still closed. 
There was so much misinformation um, that I actually had several queries on Twitter and on email from journalists from across the world, some from Spain, some from here in Canada, elsewhere, because I had tweeted that I had gotten here, I'd gotten to Simferopol, and they were like, really, you landed? Can we come? I'm like, it's open, I, I bought a ticket, I'm over. Um, I was happy to help, but I was a bit disturbed. It was kind of a first indication that perhaps, you know, as there is in every conflict, there seemed to be some misinformation out there about what was happening on the ground. In any case, once we uh, got to our uh, hotel, we had to hit the ground running again. So we drove to a base called, if I can say this correctly, Peravalne, that's what it's called, about a half hour away from the capital where we knew that there was a military base with Ukrainian soldiers and uh, apparently it was guarded by Russian soldiers. It was surrounded by Russian soldiers. So we thought, well, let's go take a look. So we approach cautiously. This is my first look at anything like this. I didn't want to run in there. Um, but there were other media there because apparently the Ukrainian commander was going to address the media on this day. So we thought we'd hit the jackpot. This is great. Someone was going to speak. Uh, we see these soldiers who look very professional. They're wearing, again, what is being described as a Russian military uniform. They're clearly very disciplined. They're not a militia. They're not self-defense units. This is an army of some kind. Um, they're wearing balaclavas. But the Ukrainians would tell us over the, uh, you know, uh, we, we couldn't tell. There were no insignia. They don't have anything on them indicating that they're Russian. But the Ukrainians that we interviewed tell us that um, then and over the next few days that there was no doubt in their minds that these men were Russian. Some of them, they said they knew by name. Some of them said they even drank vodka with them. <laughs> the soldiers didn't mind being filmed. They let you come right up to their faces. And our cameraman, Osama Farag, who had just come in from Toronto, tested this theory and no problems. This, by the way, is Osama, who had successfully come all the way from Toronto to Crimea by himself with 10 pieces of luggage and only one missing. That was his clothing bag. <laughs> Poor guy. Ready to fight. We, we have, the security advisor that comes with us normally, you know, is there for, to advise us. He's not there to, you know, protect us or anything. If anything, obviously, if something horrible happens, he would, but he's there to advise us on whether we should do things or not. These security guys notice things that, that we don't because they're, they're around this stuff. And, and he pointed out very early on that they're, he says, take a look at the weapons. He says, there are no magazines. I'm taking a look, I don't know what a mat, I mean, I don't know if a weapon is loaded or not. And he said, take a look, and we did. And we filmed it. There were no magazines in, one out of every five of the soldiers actually had a magazine in, in his gun. Uh, which is an interesting detail, I thought. So I, I hadn't seen that anywhere, so I reported that that day, and I got several notes saying, hmm, interesting, I didn't know that. We see the Ukrainians, of course, from behind the fence, and we see the U anguished families standing outside, wondering when their loved ones were coming out. They bring them food because no one was feeding them. Um, we met one woman who had brought food for her, for her husband, and she says that uh, Russians and Ukrainians in Crimea had always got along. They always drank vodka together. They always ate together. She did not understand. She said, why did these people have to come and, and change that? Shortly afterwards, the commander of the base comes out to speak to us, and the question was to him, and the reason he, we were all waiting is because the Russians had put it to him that he had to, what he said were the Russians at this point, I hadn't proven that yet. Um, he said they, you know, either surrender or walk away. And he had come out to say they'd had a chat about it and they were not surrendering. So it's getting dark as we rush back to start the filing process. And every second counts, as you can imagine. So we are on the phone, on this ride, um, to our desks, trying to figure out what the plan is, what the story is. Um, I'm going through the pictures that I took on my phone. I'm frustrated because I'm expected to tweet every second I can. But neither of my phones are working. I'm calling London, trying to get data on my phone. My local phone is not working. Uh, all this is happening, and we're also still required to do live hits by phone. So we're trying to do that as well. Um, and in less than two hours, I had to file my first story, my first television story. And so two hours seems like so little time. I just landed that morning. But it's the reality. That's what we have to do. In the meantime, I, so they sit me down and I, I can start going through the material. Tracy McRib and Osama 
are going through the material that we gathered and compiling, you know, compiled it and sent it to Toronto because our editing is being done in Toronto. It's just simpler that way. It takes less time and is less taxing on the cameraman who has to shoot all day and then all night and start editing. It's just too much for, for one person on a busy story like this. The internet is not fully cooperating. Tracy is already planning for tomorrow. She's also helping Margaret Evans, who I'm sure most of you know, the beautiful voice of Margaret Evans, our London radio correspondent, who is also with us on this trip, and another one of us prairie girls who seem to be really well built for this kind of job. In any case, by the early morning, I've written two versions of my story. Each one must be checked by the desk and then edited in Toronto, as I mentioned. So I voice it, I record it myself, and I edit it and I send it in. In the meantime, I'm putting on makeup to get ready for my own camera. And those are always the last things we do every day, and I have to tell you, it's at, at three in the morning. <laughs> you can imagine how much makeup you'd have to put on to, <laughs> to look like you're actually excited about doing this. At 3 a.m., finally, after having gotten up when I told you we caught up that flight at 8, um, we finally pack it in. I had found two stories, I felt pretty good about myself. One for the local shows and another for the national. Even though it's hard to find words at 3 in the morning, we do one more chat with uh, Ian Hanneman at Saints show. And just as I'm falling asleep, I, I remember that I was supposed to book my flights for this trip. <laughs> so I had to get up again and it was until 4 in the morning until I was in bed. So, some conclusions from, from all of this. Seeing is believing. I have to tell you that. Without actual eyes on the ground, looking for you, the viewer, from not an American perspective, not a partisan perspective, but from an ordinary Canadian Winnipegger's perspective, you will never know what is truly happening on the ground. That airport surrounded by soldiers, those troops looking to fight with no magazines and the automatic rifles, those are crucial details. And in this case, reporting them incorrectly could be the difference between, could literally be the difference between war and peace. An objective, neutral voice on the ground in cases especially like this, I believe, in my humble opinion, are indispensable. The other lesson is uh, the demands are enormous. Enormous. And they have grown even in the time that I've been around at the CBC, which has been officially 10 years. This means that our gathering time, as I mentioned, you know, we arrived one hour and a few hours later we're already filing. Our gathering time has shrunk, yet the number of clients is endless. The technology is supposed to make our lives easier, but it also makes it easier to file. And so everyone knows this and expects us to file. Um, the demands on our time make it very tough, but we try our very best, as I said, to provide accurate, responsible information. But it does get harder and harder and harder. Back to the diary. We finally get a decent amount of sleep, and we woke up to word of a shooting in Belbeck Base. Far as we know, those were the first shots fired since the crisis started, even if they were warning shots. We quickly learned from colleagues who had gotten there that it's very tense. Just around the same time, we learned that Mr. Putin is due to speak for the first time since the crisis started. We know we will have to include both in our story. And I don't know about you, but I wanted to hear the man's words directly. I didn't want to read it in some story. I wanted to actually listen as, and see the expression on his face as he spoke. The last time I had seen him was on that boardwalk uh, on the Black Sea, where he, as I said, talked about winning hockey against us. So we, uh, we also had our morning run to cover. You know, at the CBC, we have the national, we have the afternoon shows, but we also have news network, as you know, and radio, and. Twitter and all of that stuff. So um, we decided that the Melbeck event was, was, was done. The shooting had happened. They were negotiating. We knew that much already. So we decided to watch Putin's speech and then go to Melbeck afterwards. So it's, it's a triage situation. You have to decide what your priorities are, and that's what we decided. We started tweeting, doing live reports, checking the video that was available of this incredible incident, which I'm sure you all saw, where um, that face-off, where that group of Ukrainian soldiers marched towards the Russians to talk and to ask to return to work. You guys did see that, right? It's quite a moment. It's, it's one of those TV moments that, yeah, that we all watch. Uh, and we like to watch. Then, so we, we did the Putin run, if you will, and, um, and then finally we went off to Belbek. It's about a, an hour and a quarter away. Again, it's late in the day and we would like to come back as quickly as possible. 
not just for our deadlines, but because our security advisor says it's best not to travel in the dark. So we set a time limit. We will be on the ground for one hour maximum before heading back. We get there and they let us onto the base. It's the first time I step foot onto a Ukrainian base and they seem to have figured out that media coverage is a good idea. In fact, they had taken media with them when they had walked towards those Russian, Russian soldiers. But they didn't call us, I was really upset. <laughs> Within minutes, we had sight of the colonel in charge himself, the man you remember seeing, who was actually the man leading the, the group, very obviously a courageous man. Um, and he had a very grave, solemn look on his face. Um, it was a very serious face and it was raining. He just looked like, like a very serious man. One advantage, of course, of having listened to Putin before seeing these guys was that I could quote Putin directly to him and say, what did you think of Putin saying that there were no Russian soldiers on the ground? And it was another one of those classic TV moments. His face was priceless, the look on his face. Uh, he kind of arched his eyebrow and he smiled broadly. He didn't say, he didn't need to say anymore, really. But he did. And he said that no one else in the region could possibly be that well equipped. And he, as the colonel in the Ukrainian army, would not. I'll take his word for it. While talking to him, I'm holding my mic in one hand and my phone in the other, taking pictures of him. <laughs> so that I could tweet as, er, as soon as possible, or as soon as it is polite to do so. I would have loved to uh, stay to get more. We talked to another one of the soldiers who had been there, but um, they told us that they were waiting for word from the Russians. They had put a proposal to the Russians saying, why don't we jointly watch this base? Why don't we have patrols, joint patrols, Ukrainian, Russian, as a compromise, and let us go back to work. We want to go back to work. So they were waiting. There was an hour left before the Russians were coming back to them with an answer, but we could not wait because we had deadlines. So we arranged so that we could find out what the answer was without physically being there again, trying to find, trying to find ways to solve these issues. Um, and we headed back because we, it was dark, it was late, and our deadlines were looming. At night, we, uh, as we're filing, we did hear that the Russians got back to them and, and refused, of course. They didn't want to do these joint patrols. But at night, we heard about yet another event. We were thick in filing already. I was in the middle of my story. The deadlines were looming. I'm always late. I always overwrite. So it's, it's a constant problem. Um, we hear about UN representative Robert Seri, who, as I'm sure you probably all saw, was, uh, there was a, a wire alert saying that he'd been apprehended by gunmen. Uh, it was not clear what the source was, uh, so we had our suspicions about what was going on, and, and I didn't want to go with it. I didn't want to, uh, you know, even attempt to try to prove it. I just said that's we don't know. We don't know if it's true or not. Sure enough, just shortly afterwards, we started seeing tweets from the journalist who was accompanying him, saying, in fact, he had not been um, apprehended by government, but he was in fact at a cafe which was surrounded by a couple of. Uh, these militiamen and some protesters. Essentially, he was being harassed. That's a big difference between being apprehended by government and being found in a cafe, um, barricaded in a cafe. Eventually, we did see the pictures. Eventually, he, he did, we managed to get out of the cafe, get into his convoy, which was surrounded by angry pro-Russian protesters, and uh, headed for the airport. So half our team decided we needed to see this again with our own eyes. So half the team decided that they would go out and try to investigate. So Margaret and Tracy went to the airport to try to find out with Osama. And uh, they, never, they never managed to see him. They spoke to a, a, an airport uh, spokesman who confirmed that he was on his way somewhere. But, uh, but we, never, we never got pictures of him. I didn't because I was in the middle of my, one of my deadlines. Uh, so Sari, we found out, had gone out and left Crimea altogether. So the lessons here. There simply aren't enough of us um, doing what we do. We don't have enough bureaus, and that means we have to pick our battles. It's just the reality. Ideally, we would have had somebody in Moscow listen to the Putin speech and cover that story separately, using their expertise and their knowledge and their, their, uh, yeah, their knowledge of Putin and of Russia what he has said before, to compare what he said now, um, and to put it all into context. And we do have such a person. His name is Jean-François Bélanger. You probably know him as well. He uh, happened to be in Crimea as well, though. He's an extremely capable reporter. 
He's one of the rare reporters, we used to have a few of them, I'm sure many of you know, but he's one of the very few now who is linguistic, li see, I can't even say it, linguistically ambidextrous. He can file in French and in English fluently and sophist very sophisticated in both cases. And he can do radio, TV, shoot, edit, tweet. I mean, the man is, uh, is a wonder. Um, but even with his incredible talents, he's just one reporter with one cameraman, no producer, not even any interns at that office. Virtually no support. So as hardworking as Jean-François Bélanger is, and I'm one of his biggest fans, he cannot keep up with that very busy region. It's certainly not for both English and French. So we have to do without his expertise. That's just the reality. I'm the very terrible fill-in for, for his expertise. He's been living in Russia for three years. I've only started going to Russia last year. So both networks have to do without a reporter in Moscow. It is a matter of resources. That's the bottom line. There's no question that foreign reportage is expensive. There's <coughs> no denying that. So naturally, it's, um, it has been a target for cuts, not just at the CBC, but across media organizations around the world. That means that bureaus across the world have shrunk in number and in size. It means that stories are dipped into and dipped out of. There are fewer and fewer specialists. And as you know, I, you know, having lived in the Middle East for seven years, I'm very much into specialists. And I think there's a huge need for specialists in our, in our business. Um, in London, uh, where I'm now based, though, I cover the world. And in recent months, I've physically been able to go to Nairobi, Beirut, Vienna, Ireland, Moscow, St. Petersburg, Sochi, and Crimea. But I have also filed stories about Syria and Cote d'Ivoire and a number of other places that I did not set foot in. Sometimes it's places that I know. So I have ways of doing some reporting to find out what is going on, to try to confirm some things by telephone or email or Skype. But sometimes I don't. And I really, we all do, try to minimize the number of stories we do this way. But in today's world where a deployment of just two people could cost thousands and thousands of dollars, there is unfortunately no avoiding it. Here's my next entry. For the next couple of days, we are getting the hang of what's on the ground and want to go to the Black Sea. Admittedly, I was obsessed with the idea because Sochi was so close and I had just been there. And I simply wanted to point down the coast and say that. But news kept, this is the expression we kept using, tracing on, but news kept slapping us around. Suddenly a wire report claims that the Crimean government had just voted unannounced that it would join Russia. There's a news headline. They also voted to move up the referendum to allow the residents of Crimea to vote on this decision. We had no inkling this was coming. We had not heard that there was a debate in Parliament. Um, but according to the Vice Premier, whose news conference we were also not invited to, it was all but a done deal. We were apparently, according to him, essentially now in Russia. He said that Ukrainian soldiers were now occupiers, that either should surrender or walk away. We ditched the Black Sea, we were not going to go do that little stand-up that I wanted to do, and decided to go out at least to Parliament to see what was going on there. We find a friendly crowd compared to what others uh, had seen in the past. They were singing and dancing to old Russian songs, people carrying um, old and new Russian flags, Soviet flags, and celebrating. It wasn't as big a crowd as I would have expected given the news, and given the fact that Crimea is two-thirds ethnic Russian, in case you didn't know that. Um, but I didn't know why that crowd wasn't big. I, I couldn't figure it out, and I, I didn't have time to figure it out. I, I wanted to ask, I mean, are people at work? Are they afraid to come to the street? I don't know. I don't know why the crowd wasn't big. Anyway, that's all I wrote that day. It was a very busy day. In the meantime, the international unarmed military observers had landed in Odessa. You heard about this, OSCE had sent Representative from, representatives from 25 different countries to provide independent uh, verification of quote-unquote unusual military activity. So we thought about it. Should we go? It's six hours away to Odessa. Not just like driving from here to Winnipeg, I understand. Um, so it's not that far, but can we? We don't have the time. Can we, can we invest six hours and come back and file in time? We can't. 
Tracy then becomes the one who's the one handling the information, uh, getting information about the observers. She had, we have a source close to the mission who knew what they were up to, and we were tweeting updates on that constantly along with actual pictures. We have our evening run, which now includes live hits, by the way, because after hours of troubleshooting uh, the internet connection, Osama, our cameraman, manages to get the live system up and running. So the desk is thrilled, and I'm thrilled, because it always helps when you get to see us talking in person as opposed to being on the phone or on Skype. But of course that creates a monster, because then you watch it every hour. So we have to kind of balance things out. We've got to make sure we have time to gather in the field, the little time we still have, but also be able to do a few hits to connect with the audience. I was also supposed to file an online piece that day. Um, and I, but it was so busy, news-wise, that I get a break from the desk. They said, it's okay, we don't need it today, you can file it tomorrow. The story that I wanted to file was on Putin. I wanted to compare the two different Putins that I'd seen in the matter of just a few days. I think we went to sleep around four in the morning that day. So the lesson's there. I've always believed that context from the ground is part of my job. I don't think my job is just to feed the news. I think anybody can do, can do that. I think just about anybody could go to a conflict zone and find out firsthand what's going on and, um, and relay it to you. No? Yeah. But providing that analysis is yet another thing that I think is part of my job, no matter where I go. Um, but it's another thing to add to an already long list of products and elements that we have to deliver. It's frustrating because on the ground you notice things, as I mentioned, that someone writing from Washington or Ottawa is not going to notice. And my compulsion is to try to fit that into my coverage. But given the demands I mentioned, it's, it's nearly impossible. There are also fewer and fewer places for us to actually deliver, let's say, a large contextual project, pro product like that. Uh, again, because of cost. We don't generate enough stories to sustain any foreign affairs shows anymore. So we've watched shows that you know well, I'm sure, like Dispatches on radio, around the world on TV, and Una Sorte on Radio Canada on television. All of them disappeared, one after the other. Looking at the larger pool of foreign reporting, so beyond the CBC, it tends, um, it tends to focus on the spasms of violence, on the spikes of conflict, on some sort of rupture, and not enough on the everyday slices of life, again, for the same reasons that I've been mentioning. In this particular story, there seemed to be, and I was guilty of it too, focusing too much on the machinations or the preparations for war, without enough about what it was doing to the people themselves. To try to mitigate this, we try to include at least one voice. At least, if I could just do that, I could sleep at night. Just one voice from ordinary people who could tell me what, how they were feeling that day. We tried on this trip, we did try, to step away from the news to do just one contextual story. I wanted to go to Yalta. How many of you actually know what Yalta is? Probably a good number of you. Yeah. It's, it's central to the history of Crimea and to the reason we're going through this again. And yet, I did raise it at another gathering and there were people who had never heard of it. And so I felt it was my job then to tell the story of Yalta, but not just to tell the story of Yalta, because you can do that from here. You can do that from Ottawa, you can do that from Washington. I want to physically go to Yalta and, um, and tell the story through today's eyes. So instead of a history lesson, you would actually get something that was alive. Um, something that provided some explanation of why we found ourselves here. But again, it goes back to resources. News was our primary task. That's what our audiences were depending on us for. Good, comprehensive, and accurate news. So even though I wanted to write about Putin, and even though I wanted to go to Yalta, I, I had to put that all on the shelf. News had to come first, we would provide context when we could. In-depth context, that would have to wait. So here's one of the last entries in my, uh, in my diary. It's even shorter, and there are no full sentences. And I'm reading it the way it is. The next day we tried to go to ship, no luck. The Ukraine, we went to the Ukrainian protest, chasing the observers. Waited and waited, and then nothing. 
wasted opportunity of ship, filed on military observers being rejected at frontier, online peace that went nowhere again, tweeted, checked out flights, heard journalists had been beaten up, saw CCTV video of journalists beaten up, news hits, Ian's show, Top and Tail, local shows, the national, sleep. That's all I wrote. The lesson here it is almost always hazardous for journalists to work in situations like this. And I'm referring to what really struck me that day where it was a CCTV video of, of the journalist, Bulgarian journalist being beaten up. There's nothing new in journalists being beaten up in these situations. You've heard it a million times. It's terrible, of course. It's horrible when foreign journalists are targeted, but it's part of the territory. No sympathy needed. It's part of our jobs. Um, what was more instructive, I thought, that was happening was what was happening with local journalists. On the same day that the Crimean government had voted to join Russia, we had heard that gunmen had taken over a local network and shut it down. That night was too far to go out to try to confirm it. Um, but we wanted to at least confirm that those networks were off the air. So we asked our fixer to find out for us. Our hotel had satellite television, so we couldn't tell. So we had to call friends and have them you know, go at home and go through the channels and actually tell us what was there and what wasn't. It took a, actually took a few hours. But finally, all I could report that night was that indeed two Ukrainian channels had been taken off the air and that one was added and that was a Russian TV station. Who did this? I don't know. Were there gunmen involved? I don't know. I reported what I knew. Here's the final entry from the diary, and again, it's quite choppy. Um, woke up to go to the ship. Still trying to get to the ship. Again derailed, again slapped around by news. Tatar protest. Something happening, clashes. Then self-defense unit. Mean men with batons, dogs, armbands. Swearing oath to the new Crimean government. Disturbing, it's hard to watch. Reminded me of that day on March 2nd, 2004 in Baghdad. A tense crowd that could turn on a dime. Verbal argument on the street, sad to watch. Reminded me of Egypt. Military movements found out late in the day. Convoy of dozens of trucks and military personnel arriving in Simferopol. Raid overnight on Ukrainian airbase. Observers shot at. For once, we gathered a full story. Filed live. Two scripts, tweeting and reporting. Packed, handover, slept one hour, got on a plane and off to Kiev. At the airport, wrote a piece on Putin. <laughs> the lesson here. When push comes to shove, and that's, this is really the point that, that I'm getting at. When a story is this big, when the whole world is watching, when so much is at, is at stake, we do do it right. We have the resources we need. We get a producer, which we don't always get. We have a security person, which we don't always get. We had a second crew doing stories from Kiev while we were in Crimea to provide some context. In the large scheme of things, though, we do have to pick our, pick our battles, as I mentioned. Covering the story wall-to-wall, -wall, Ukraine, which we still are, will mean that we will spend, won't spend as much time on other stories. It's just the reality of our business now. There are fewer bureaus, as I mentioned, and reporters, and that will miss, mean that we'll miss some of the nuances. And when the story quiets down and we all leave, things will happen that we won't report. Because of the lack of resources on these big stories, we do the beginning really, really well, as I hope you agree. I, in my humble opinion, think we do. We do the middle of the story, we do a very good, respectable job with the middle of the story, but the ending is sometimes sacrificed for the next story. It's just the reality. Victim to the lack of bodies and resources to continue the coverage. We have to target our money to the biggest and most important stories, but to do our jobs properly, we have to be telling the middle and the end of the story. Why? And this is where I have to stop and tell you that that's as far as I got in actually writing a speech. I'm not a natural speech uh, giver. I've, I normally have to write down what I uh, have to say because I, I'm used to two-minute lives, not one-hour lectures. 
So I don't trust myself to remember or to have little notes and to be sound coherent, as you'll see now in the next five minutes. <laughs> um, but like a foreign assignment, I have, to, I have to keep going. And I wanted to meet this deadline too. So uh, a compromise had to make, be made. And so what I've done here is make small notes. And I'm going to use them. This is me practicing on my speech telling speech. I can't even say it. Um, and so this is what I wrote. This is a tiny bit of diary that I wrote on my way here on the plane. It's only 40 minutes before the flight lands. I'm not going to get this speech done. I would have to wing my conclusion, just like I did, just like I did with that stand-up in Baghdad a decade ago. So I made some no uh, some point form notes to help me along, and here goes. So it's true here. So why do we do this is what I wrote. I'm not going to read them, I'm actually going to try and speak them to you. So why do we do this? Because not every Canadian gets to go to Crimea. We do this because every Canadian deserves to know what is going on in Crimea. We do this because we think you deserve a Canadian perspective on what's happening in Crimea. And that you deserve verifiable information about what's going on in Crimea. Um, we also think that you deserve, I think you deserve, we all deserve, to know information that would help us make decisions on what our leaders across the world are doing, Canada and beyond. So that's why I do this. People say, why do you do this? You know, and they feel sorry for me. Don't feel sorry for me. I love my job. Um, it's not easy. This run started for me, this particular run started for me on January 6th. So today was the 65th day in a row that I've written something. Even for me, that's a lot. I like to write. So it's time for a break for me, uh, but I'm back to Crimea next week. That's the plan. Um, and I've managed to make this deadline, maybe not perfectly, as I said, because I would have liked to write some nice ending lines for this speech. Um, but as I said, no one's putting a gun to my head or to any of our heads, whether it's Margaret Evans or David Common, or Susan Ormiston, or Adrian Arsenault, all the names that you know, no one's putting guns to our heads. We take this very seriously. I take this as a mission. I take this very, very important mission. And trust me, seeing you here tonight, and I did actually write this sentence down, I'm reading, because I want to make sure I say it right. Seeing you here, knowing that you were watching and continue to watch and listen and read us, makes every single obstacle along the way worth it. Thank you for being here. Just a reminder, don't make your 20th sentence a question. Please. Hi, my name is Brenda Tatchett. As a former student of journalism, I know that it is hard enough to interview as an English person, an, uh, an English-speaking source, to uh, have enough context and background to be able to uh, counter, they may be blandly lying to you or giving you a, a really biased uh, side of the story, and to be able to pick that apart and counter them and ask them a hard question, how the heck do you do it when you may be speaking through an interpreter and you may not have the context to, you may not, you've been parachuted in and you don't even, 
It's know about hard. the stories. Uh, and also, I wanted to say, we never get to see you smile on TV because your stories are mostly sad and you have a wonderful smile. <laughs> Maybe cry, make me smile, or one more. Uh, it's it's you're you you're completely right. And I actually it's funny because I'm so used to working in the Middle East. I I forget how frustrating it is because obviously I speak Arabic, so that helps a lot in the Middle East. But um, in Russia, I wanted to tear my hair out because I'm so used to as as you say to hear people you know and knowing exactly what they're saying. And so it, it's extremely hard. And so what you need is an incredibly good translator. You have to have one, and one who can, and those are hard to find, but one who can read kind of between the lines and tell you what's between the lines. And it means a debriefing with that person after the interview. Like, what did that mean when he arched his eyebrow? Or like, you know what I mean? It's, it's actually two interviews. Every interview becomes two. And it becomes a face reading exercise as well. I find myself picking up words too. Like if I know, you know, if I know a word and I latch onto it and somebody says problema or something, you know, then I know there's, the facial expression means something. Context, absolutely. In my case, I mean, aside from the fact that I grew up in Winnipeg and I feel I know Ukrainian culture fairly well, um, I, I read extensively about this stuff. Have I ever covered the story on this particular subject? No. And so, of course I'm lacking context. But I rely on um, my own ability to research on local knowledge, but also on my very experienced colleagues who we never stop learning from each other. Margaret Evans is one of the um, smartest journalists I know, and she does know the Ukraine story, and she, very lucky for me, happened to be on this deployment. So I deferred to her quite a bit, and she might do the same for me when she comes to Lebanon. So we, we work together. We try to help each other with this stuff. So that's as close an answer as I can go up with. Um, sir. Hi, um, you talked about dwindling uh, resources in the uh, TV news, and looking over the crowd here, I see a lot of other gray heads. Um, and I'm wondering if, if you think that this generation sort of reflects your TV audience and in total, including Twitter and stuff, mm -hmm. and whether it's going to be a problem um, if young people aren't listening to your kind of reporting. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it is true that, I mean, we have, I'm not, just to make it very clear, I'm not privy to the numbers of, of our demographics. So everything I'm going to, about to say, I know anecdotally, is that yes, definitely our audience is an older audience, but that we do have a growing younger audience. I do know that much. And I do know that we are very much also trying to, to cater to a younger audience. We do want... We want all Canadians to watch the CBC. We think that the stuff we offer shouldn't be relevant to Canadians of all ages. But clearly it's an issue if we can't interest young people in current affairs and in, in today's news, whether it's Canadian or international. I mean, it's one of my passions to make sure that young people are interested in the world, whether they're journalism majors or not. And so I, you know, I, my, my little world, I do my little part by encouraging kids to travel, for example. There's, we have a, a little program at the University of Manitoba that I support where it's encouraging kids to be global citizens, you know, to, to care about the world and maybe go travel, maybe go, even if it's just a gap year, go somewhere different and learn something new. Because if we don't encourage those things, young people may not care about the news. They may not care about what's happening in the rest of the world. And my humble opinion, and you might disagree with me, they <coughs> But yes, I know there are efforts being made to, to try to, to, to bring on a younger audience as well. We need both. We do need both. Yeah. Sir. Hello. Uh, I was reading your book again this afternoon. It was right across the term that you used, Gorba. What is it? Gorba, yeah. What is it? Yeah. There. Is that there? there. Yes. Uh, estrangement, alienation, desolation, that sort of thing. Do you see that as part of the, um, of the basis for the Mujahideen in, in the Middle East, uh, where they do feel stateless and homeless? The Mujahideen, like who? Well, like the followers of um, Osama bin Laden, who would tend to think of not for themselves as nationalists, but as almost non nationalists. That's a good question. I'm not sure that that's who I would associate that feeling with. I, I would think that. Unlike other people, this is me speculating here, 
that people perhaps who belong to organizations like that feel some sort of belonging and they don't feel any kind of estrangement. It's, it's the ones who don't, who feels, it's the ones who feel that don't, they don't belong and that they're not being respected as citizens or given any rights that feel this alienation, I think. That's, I, that would be kind of my on-the-spot analysis on that one, but it's a very good question. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for asking. Something strange going on with that. Maybe I'm too close to it. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, you mentioned how you were doing an interview where you were taking pictures for Twitter with one hand and you had the mic in the other hand. That uh, demand on journalists to kind of fill all these needs, how is it helping journalism and how is it hurting journalism? Julie's been asking me hard questions all day. <laughs> um, I think it helps journalism because there are young people, to, to, over to your question again, who perhaps may not be watching my story in the National, actually probably likely aren't watching my story in the National, who may very well see it on Twitter and who might find it interesting to see this face, as I said to you, his face was just said it everything, the look on his face said it all. And may, maybe one or two younger people who only look at the news on Twitter might actually pique their interest, you know? So that's, that's the upside. And also the instantaneousness of it. I mean, there is, sometimes it's a picture of a person, but sometimes I've been able to capture amazing things on my, you know, on Twitter, I'm sure all of you have who tweet, um, where you see, and, you know, I don't know, I, when, when we saw Putin that one time, I saw him, so I took a picture and I tweeted it. It's sort of instant live news, you know? The downside, of course, is that you're, you're only hearing half of what he's saying. Like you're not listening as you should, and you're not thinking of your next question, and you're, it's distracting. But it's, again, as I said, all of our stories are kind of compromises. All of our days are compromises. And so I think maybe the benefits in that case outweigh the negatives. In that case. Yes, please. I'm a social worker, and I'm a human rights advocate, and I have been for many years. As I listen to you speak about your daily run, your weekly runs, um, it sounds almost like 24-7 and very little sleep. What happens to your emotions and your spirit when you leave those stories behind? Stories that are still going on in the world and you can't follow up on them because of all the new emerging stories that are so important. How do you do that? How do you handle that? I wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't help it. I just, I'm a walking broadcast machine. I can't stop thinking and talking about this stuff. And, and now I'm, I'm already having arguments with my bosses about Ukraine because I, I tried, as I wrote, I shouldn't be saying this, but I wrote this Putin piece on Sunday, but it was a bit outdated, so it never ran, the one I wrote at the airport. I just can't help it. I need to keep talking and writing about this stuff. But you're absolutely right. It's it's always in on your mind. But we do take vacations, you know, occasionally. Yeah, occasionally we do. Take Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, my question is: You spoke um, a lot about how it's very important for you to reflect the values, the insights of Canadians. But so much of your job is spent um, overseas. Very so how do you maintain that and continue that? It's an excellent question. I mean, the way I would answer that is that I think my identity, and I wrote about this in the book, was actually formed, as a lot of people's are, in those first few years of life. And it just so happens, the first few years of my life, I, I, I was born and raised in Winnipeg. And so but very much my identity is rooted in those first few years. And, and funny and not funny enough, it was in a little neighborhood called saint Boniface in, in Winnipeg, where the first schooling I got was in French. So I, you know, I kind of had all of Canada in this little tiny package at the St. Boniface and Archibald Street. So that's, I'd say that's the first part of my answer. The second is that you're absolutely right. It's, we are in danger of losing that when you live abroad for so long. And many of us do do that. I was brought back, I was one of the first foreign correspondents to be brought back to Canada. Um, actually, the first. Uh, in 2009, when I was done in the Middle East, I was asked to come back to Canada. I'd never worked for CBC in Canada, so I did. I came back and lived in Montreal, actually. 
and then moved to Toronto for a year. Um, so that was huge in kind of reconnecting me with Canada, but also every year we do come home. There's a trip a year that you have to do, and you, um, you know, we come back for to see friends and weddings and babies, and my family, my mom and dad would kill me if I didn't come home twice a year. So that's, I think that's a, another way we do it. But you're right, it, it's something we have to work on. I mean, I try to read the Canadian media, you know, the, as much as I read The Guardian and The Telegraph and all this stuff, I have to read The Globe and I have to read, you know, watch the other networks to kind of see what the thinking is. Here. So, but it's a, mm -hmm. it's a good reminder you asking that question. Well, good, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> no one else will do it. I, I'm wondering, uh, you mentioned local media, and granted it might not always be available, but uh, what efforts, in the spirit of, of wanting to get that context, what efforts do you make to contact local media as you go into these foreign places, as you parachute it in? Not enough. It's a good question. Not enough. We don't. Um, we eventually, uh, you know, not that every store is the same, but they're not, but we eventually somehow get onto local media by virtue of some news event that happens. But. Um, Often, the one way we do sometimes automatically plug into local media is through the fixtures we work with. Because often they are actually journalists in their own right who don't mind taking a break from their usual job to work with us. They get some experience, we get what we want, and everybody's happy. So, um, so that's one instant way that we do it. But generally speaking, I would say it's, it's not something that's immediate. And we should. We should. Why don't you? <laughs> I think. The kinds of days I just explained really are the reason. That is really the reason. And also because we try, it's, it's not often that you see other media even when you're out gathering and doing these things, but what we do actually, it's fantastic because we do share information. Like in the Middle East, by the way, it's different for me. I'm thinking right now about Ukraine, but in the Middle East, absolutely, it was always connected to the local media. And you'd go to a press conference and meet six people and you know exchange cards and get information and trade tape. and. But yeah, it, it always happens, but it happens organically. I don't think, I don't remember ever landing in a place and calling a place and just saying, hey, I'm here from Canada, can you help me? I've never done that, but it happens organically on the ground. Good question. Yes. Um, I'm just curious. I've just been seeing, I've been seeing little bits and pieces. Um, and so hopefully being on the ground for a little time will be work. Uh, what's happening in Ukraine? There's been rumblings about the government that's taking over. Mm -hmm. That there are a number of factions that are extreme, that are fascist, that are anti-Semitic, that are like a lot of really right-wing neo-Nazi flags, all kinds of little bits mm -hmm. coming through. Have you seen or heard anything about that? And what that is? The honest truth is that I have nothing beyond what I've read. So that's definitely a story we have to look into when we go back. But that's my the honest truth is that I don't I have not seen that been a helicopter view so far. Maybe on my next trip. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts on, in this age of Twitter and uh, fast media and 24-7 broadcasting, how do you balance the worry, the concern over oversimplification, particularly when you see a generation sometimes who, frankly, I've noticed, will only read a headline or only read a tweet. Mm -hmm. How do you get that context into such a limited space? It's our constant challenge. It is our constant challenge. It, it's, it's, um, I don't know what the answer is, but we do try really hard. I mean, to, as far as I'm concerned, I've always thought of online, we call it online, but really it's print reporting, as kind of being our outlet for that sort of stuff. Um, and also learning the language of television and, and radio. I, it's a hard thing to write for TV. Um, but it's, it's even harder to build in context in a piece when you've got two minutes. But there is a way to do it, and I'm still learning this myself, you know, 10 years in. But we try to tweet our TV pieces, we try to tweet our online pieces. I don't know if it's working, and I mean, maybe you guys can tell me. But I don't think we've found the answer yet. If you have some ideas, let me know. <laughs> I wish I did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll keep trying. Um, I know that you talked about how you got one hour of sleep um, when you started there and how you had gone to bed at um, like four o'clock twice, you said it, and um, I was just wondering if that ever affects your ability to even 
write or think clearly or um, do your story <laughs> in the end because, I mean, do you just get used to it or are you just that driven where it just comes out? It totally affects how you look, absolutely. I mean, and especially in that time zone because you, you start to get tired. I mean, I live in London, so you start to get tired right when you're supposed to be writing, which is like the worst possible. It's, it's just not, it's not good. So it, the thing is, it is, is that it's cumulative. Like it, the first few days you're running out of adrenaline and, and you don't feel it. You just want to get your job done and whatever. But it starts to add up. And if you don't get a day off, it, it does start to catch up to you, for sure. And do they just, um, do you plan to get a day off? Like do you make sure that you do have that one? Time? Sometimes you can't. I think it's, we, we really do push ourselves kind of to the, to the utmost and, and then you, you kind of think, okay, now I need a break. So let's say if, if I hadn't come here for this and for Ottawa, with a speech I did in Ottawa, I would be in Ukraine right now. And um, I would have gotten there, this Friday would have been two weeks, or this Saturday, whatever, whatever it is. And I probably would have refused to leave until the referendum was over. And then I would collapse, you know, <laughs> after that. It, it is kind of almost an unhealthy obsession um, with this work. But it's, it's uh, again, it's a motivation. It's a, it's, it's, we're very motivated to do this stuff. So. But, yeah, sometimes I think what we need are bosses, and they do, do this sometimes, saying, you've got to, you, go home and rest. That does happen sometimes. No problem. Hi. A couple of things that struck me was, uh, you mentioned this a few times and you said, uh, but it's not courageous what I do, and I don't need any sympathy, and it's fine. Mm -hmm. And I'm just It's not an act, I mean that. <laughs> and, well, and even just picturing, like, Susan Ormiston in her press jacket going, so are you a Russian soldier last week? Like, when does, does fear ever strike you? What is the point <laughs> when you're afraid? <laughs> Does fear ever strike us? Absolutely. I mean, Susan is fearless. She's amazing. She's amazing. Um, yeah, of course it does. Of course it does. All the time. Ask Tracy. She knows. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Is it in bed six hours later, or is it? <laughs> it's true. You know, again, adrenaline kind of helps you get through some things. And also, traveling together, moving together as a group really helps. We all kind of steal each other's nerves. And we don't sit there and say, hey, I'm nervous. Although I sometimes do that, but nobody else does. Um, but you kind, of, you kind of know and you accept that. And you kind of, you know that other people are doing it. And you think, OK, we've done everything possible to make sure that we're not doing something stupid here. Like, we never throw ourselves into things, just so you know. Um, my, this is something I always assure my parents and Tracy's parents, that we never throw ourselves just willy-nilly into something. Everything's considered. We think about the options. Is this a good idea? Is it not? Time of day? Who's going to be there? How long are we staying? How are we getting back? It's all stuff we think about, and, but of course very quickly. You know, for five minutes we can actually, we've learned to make those decisions in five, ten minutes. So we don't just kind of throw ourselves. But fear? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I'm human. <laughs> yes? Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your wonderful reporting from around the world. Thank you. Um, but I'm going to ask you a question, which I hope you don't take as an unfriendly one, which is, um, do you find as someone of a Palestinian background that you have difficulty uh, being completely objective about the uh, situation in the Middle East? God, that's, a, that's not an unfriendly question at all. That's an old question. I get that all the time. <laughs> um, listen, I, somebody else asked me that today, and they asked me that yesterday. This is how I look at my job. Everybody is coming from somewhere. Every one of us here comes from somewhere. Canadian or not Canadian or whatever. My chosen profession is journalism. I didn't choose to be a journalist to stand on a platform and tell people what I think. And I didn't choose journalism to express my opinions. I can express my opinions about foreign reportage. I can give analysis about the region, or about Russia, or about Putin, or about Obama. But I didn't choose this job to say, well, this is what I think should happen in the Middle East, or not. Um, and I say this to, to students when they ask me, like, how can you be objective? Of course, nobody can be purely objective. But here's what we do. Um, I always think that you can't be a journalist, a proper journalist, unless a, 
you are willing to put yourself in the shoes, I've said this a million times, put yourself in the shoes of absolutely anybody who might be sitting in front of you for an interview, be that another Palestinian, an Israeli, a Jordanian, a Peruvian, you name it. I don't, if I cannot imagine what it's like for them to be in those shoes that they're in, then I don't deserve to tell their story. So that's my premise, always. So that's, that's the first check for me. The second check, in case that that is not good enough to ensure that I remain as objective as possible, in my business anyway, well in every business um, in the media, you're, you never work alone. I work with capable producers, we work with a desk that vets my story, and then another desk that vets our story, and then the host of the show who vets the story. If after all of that, my stories are still considered unobjective, then I guess we are. You see what I'm saying? Like it's, it's a system that's, in my humble opinion, built to ensure that if there are problems, if there are problems in reporting. So the short answer to your question is, Everybody has opinions about things. I keep mine out of my stories. Thank you. Obviously, you have your pulse on international news. You were talking about some of the cuts and the cutbacks in international bureaus. What do you think is a story, even within the last five years, that Canadian viewers have missed out on that you think would have been important, that you may have pushed for, that didn't get covered? Are you trying to get me into trouble? <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it may not be news stories. I, you know, I'm, I'm, something changed here. I'm one of these people who likes to tell people stories, and, and um, we were talking about this earlier with the journalism class. Um, I pitched a couple of stories out of Somalia uh, that I thought were interesting. I pitched a story out of South Sudan that I thought was interesting. And it, often it's been timing. That actually hasn't worked out, and those stories are still kind of in play, but they haven't happened yet. Um, so I, I'd like to tell some stories of Somalia, although I don't know where she is, but I think we found their next correspondent from Somalia in this school. Where is she? There she is up there. <laughs> Iman, I just remembered your name. Iman is going to be your next correspondent from Mogadishu. Um, but yeah, I think there are lots, listen, it's a big world. There are lots of stories we miss out on. Lots. I mean, not in America. We are, we almost, you know, we never, we don't hear enough from there. Anywhere in South America. Um, we hear some, but not enough. So I, I'd say, actually, most of the world, we don't hear enough. Of That's just, but I'm really biased that way, so. One more? It ties a bit in the last question. Yeah. Have you ever been pulled back from a story where you said, like just a few minutes ago, you said, I will not leave until you know, the referendum, etc. Yeah. Where your producer or your boss says, you've got to get out of there, something else is yes. very important, and you think that that should not happen? Or... That I've been told you've got to leave? Do you have any power to determine or to say, you know what, I'm going to stay here, this needs coverage, and you, can you put your foot down? and say, this is what I do, and your boss says, no, do you have any power? So you, you, you bring the world to us, and if there's so many hotspots, and there's only so a few of you, specialists, and you cover something that comes to us, and if there's something else going on that doesn't get covered, we we're not going to know about it, right? Exactly. Yeah. exactly. But I mean, yes, the, the short answer is, I mean, no, I can't decide what I want to do, always. I can push, I'm, I can be quite pushy and stubborn. You can ask my bosses about that, and I'll, 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 I've actually once basically camped in front of my editor's office, insisting that I go to Afghanistan, and she finally said, because she got sick of me standing in front of her office. So I'm extremely stubborn, but our bosses are our bosses for a reason. So there, I have been told sometimes, no, we don't want that angle, you gotta leave. Like, it's enough, we need to do something else, you gotta go home. And I have been told, you're tired. You, you, you're not thinking straight, you gotta wrap it up and go home. So they do, you know, they're, they're our bosses for a reason. But yeah, sometimes I will make a very strong case, and I'll go as high and, and as, as stubborn as I can be because I think we really must stay somewhere in a cover story. Sometimes I win, and sometimes I don't. Yeah. One more, if you don't mind. Sure. Any personal regrets you have in your career? Yes, per, personal story regrets, like journalism regrets. Okay, 
we'll get into the other stuff. <laughs> we'll be here all night. No, um, no, my journalism regrets, absolutely, it was Baghdad. I still wish, it, this sounds horrific, because I, I hate war, I mean, who loves war? I'm not one of those war correspondents. I don't need to wear a flak jacket on the air. Um, but I wish we had stayed, because as you know, we stayed right to the last second in Iraq, left when the bomb, just before the bombing started, and then stupid, you know, sillily, sillily, stupidly, we drove back in during the war, which was probably the most dangerous thing I've ever done. I'll never do that again. Actually, I did do it again, but anyway. Um, <laughs> that was silly. We should have just stayed. We should, and, and that was what we had decided, but it's incredible what those situations will do, will do in terms of stress level and the things you hear, and I mean, we were threatened and all this stuff. I mean, we just, in the end, we left because we were shaken, and um, I wish we'd stay. That was, that's one big one. Yeah. Thank you for what Thank you. Do. Thanks for your questions. Thank you. Last one over here. So talking about being uh, shaken, yes. um, I'm wondering how Melissa Fung's experience uh, impacted you and your family. You mentioned your parents several times personally, and what impact it has had on the CBC policy for foreign, foreign journalists, and especially female journalists in yeah. parts of the world. That's a very good question. I'm sure all of you heard about Melissa Fung's experience. I won't speak for her, but she was kidnapped for quite some time, and she wrote an amazing book about that experience in Afghanistan. And uh, there's no question, you put your finger on it, there's no question that that really um, made, you know, it, it was reason for pause for all of us, for everybody. And I think it made us um, very aware that sometimes we do we don't think as hard as, we, do, we always do, our bosses do. Let's put it this way, our bosses always think really, really long and hard about making sure we're safe. We might think a bit less about that. As, even though I just said five minutes ago that we do, with every case, we, we consider what keeps us safe, what to do. But I'm saying, I'm talking about the overall picture, that maybe we don't think often enough about those bigger fears. I mean, as, there's a big difference between being harassed on the street for a couple of minutes and then being kidnapped for a month. We don't, that's what I'm talking about, is we don't think about that scenario very often. So I think it made us all think, it made us all pause and think, wow, if it could happen to Melissa, it could happen to anybody. And so, did it stop us from doing our jobs? No, I mean, we all still do what we do, but I think it made everybody just a little bit more aware that we got to remember it could happen. Thank you very much, that's the end.